Hello, thank you for joining us today. We'll get started in just a few minutes. Hello, thank you for joining us. We'll get started in just a few minutes. Thank you for joining us today. We'll get started at the top of the hour. Hello, and thank you for joining today's webinar. We are ready to begin. Today's webinar is eligible for one contact hour. Sigma Theta Tau International Honor Society of Nursing is accredited as a provider of nursing continuing professional development by the American Nurses Credentialing Center's Commission on Accreditation. The planning committee members and speakers have disclosed no relevant financial relationships. To receive contact hours for this NCPD session, Participants are required to attend the webinar and log into our learning management system to complete an evaluation form. Information on how to access this will be emailed to all attendees approximately one week after the webinar. This webinar is being recorded and will be available via the Sigma repository within a few business days of recording. Following the presentation, if we have time, we'll have a question and answer session. You'll see on your Zoom, webinar control panel that you can send a message through the Q&A feature. This is where you can type in any question you'd like to pose to the presenters. 
Be sure to hit send so the message makes it to us. Please use the Q&A for questions and the chat feature to interact with other participants. I love to see the engagement in the chat feature already, so great job this morning. We'd like to thank our speakers for sharing their expertise with us today. Our speakers today are Patrick Choi, Janice Hawkins, and Mercy Mumba. Patrick is a registered nurse currently working in the area of professional regulation. He is a certified global nurse consultant, PhD candidate, and current president of the MU Sigma chapter and liaison to the United Nations for Sigma. Janice Hawkins is a long time member and chapter leader of Sigma and most recently a UN liaison. Serving as a UN liaison aligns with her objective to multiply her commitment, service, and expertise in global health through the international organizations that have the reach to solve health challenges worldwide. She has presented internationally and published in both peer review journals and popular media on topics related to global health and nursing education. And Dr. Mercy Mumba is an award-winning scientist and philanthropist. She is a published author in peer-reviewed scientific journals, and her research is widely funded by various agencies, including the National Institutes of Health, or NIH. She is an associate professor and founding director of the Center for Substance Use and Research and Related Conditions in the Capstone College of Nursing at the University of Alabama. She is also a Sigma liaison to the United Nations. She graduated with her PhD from the University of Texas at Arlington College of Nursing and Health Innovation in December 2016 with her Honors Bachelor of Science in Nursing in December 2010. She is the author of A Nurse's Step-by-Step -step Guide to Transitioning to an Academic Role, Strategies to Jumpstart Your Career in Education and Research. Her research focuses on substance use disorders, addictive behaviors, and their comorbid mental health conditions. We want to thank you all for being here and we'll turn it over to our presenters. Great, thanks so much, uh, Linda, for those uh, introductions and welcome everyone. It's so great to see everyone, you know, joining from different parts of the world. So we're really happy that you're here and we're excited to share some of our insights as uh, Sigma's UN liaisons. So after the session, just a few learning outcomes, we hope that you'll be able to recognize the complexities within the UN system, discuss how Sigma as an organization influences global priorities, identify the channels in which we as UN liaisons disseminate that information and knowledge to US Sigma members, and also describe the ways in which you as Sigma members or chapter leaders or nurses in general can work to contribute to the work of the UN. So just to start um, and to give a bit of a historical context, History 101, uh, some of you of course have heard of the UN but might not have um, really intimate knowledge about this um, organization. So I wanted to set the context to provide some information around how the UN actually started. So the UN is actually an intergovernmental organization. It was founded in 1945 after the Second World War and representatives from 50 countries uh, gathered at the UN Conference on International Organization in San Francisco, California between April 25th to June 26th of that year. And what happened was for the next two months, they proceeded to draft and then sign the UN Charter, which ultimately created this new international organization, the UN. And at that time, it was hoped that this international organization would prevent another world war like the one that they had just lived through. So four months after that San Francisco conference ended, the UN officially began on October 24th of 1945. And it came into existence after that charter was ratified by several countries, uh, such as China, France, the Soviet Union, the UK, the United States, um, and many other uh, signatories. 
So since 1945, the UN has grown tremendously from its original 51 member states. So when we talk about member states, it's basically referring to countries and to now 193 member states. It's become a place where the world's countries can come together to discuss issues that are of common interest and also to tackle issues that no one country can actually tackle alone. So you see on the slide that there are some key areas of work of the UN, including maintaining international peace and security, protecting human rights, um, sustainable development, which we'll get into uh, in a bit more detail, uh, international law, and also a variety of other global health issues such as aging, poverty, migration, and so forth. So this is a very busy diagram and it's not meant for you to read, but I just wanted to include this because it really shows how complex the UN system is. Um, and you'll see that the system is comprised of several organs, departments, subsidiary organs, um, commissions, etc. Uh, but I wanted to point out the main um, organs on the left uh, hand side of your screen, just to give you a bit more context in terms of where we're situated as UN liaisons for Sigma, who has special consultative status with um, the UN. So you'll see uh, that the main bodies of the UN were established under the charter in 1945. The General Assembly is the main deliberative policy making and representative organ of the UN. So all 193 member states of the UN are represented here. Um, and each year in September, the full UN membership meets in the General Assembly Hall in New York to address um, key issues and to engage in debate. So Mercy, Janice and I were actually um, just in New York in September and we'll be sharing some of our insights later in the presentation. The Security Council, they're responsible for maintaining international peace and security under the UN Charter. So they take uh, the lead in determining the existence of any threats to peace or acts of aggression. Of course, they try to settle disputes through uh, peaceful means, but they also have the authority to impose sanctions and also resort to force if needed to maintain and restore international peace and security. The Economic and Social Council, so for short, we call this ECOSOC, and this is where we actually have special consultative status. And this is a principal body for coordination, policy review, and policy dialogue on, on issues related to the economy, um, as well as social and environmental issues. The Trusteeship Council or, um, is or previously provided international supervision for 11 trust territories that were placed under the administration of seven member states. Um, this was actually suspended in 1994 because all trust territories eventually attained self-government and independence. There is the International Court of Justice. So this is the principal judicial organ of the UN. And then lastly, the Secretariat. So this basically comprises of the Secretary General, as well as the tens of thousands of staff that carry out the day-to-day -day operations of the UN. So those are the key principal organs of the United Nations system. And just I'm um, getting into a bit of uh, what we call consultative status. So consultative status at the UN basically provides NGOs um, with access to not only ECOSOC, but also many of its different subsidiary bodies, uh, various human rights mechanisms of the UN, as well as special events that are organized by the president of the General Assembly. And there's three types of consultative status. So there's general, uh, special, and roster. General status is typically given to NGOs that uh, represent large segments of society in several countries. Their work covers most issues uh, that are on ECOSOC's agenda. And usually these organizations are very large, very well established, and they have broad geographical reach. Special status is for NGOs that have a special competence in the area. So this is the status that we as Sigma have. Um, and of course, our uh, area of competence is in nursing and in health. And typically this is granted to organizations that have um, a few um, areas that are related to ECOSOC's agenda. 
And then you have roster status that's for NGOs that are typically smaller, their area um, or technical focus is a bit more narrow, and they make occasional contributions to ECOSOC. So as of now, there I think there are actually about 6,000 uh, NGOs or civil society organizations that have some type of consultative status with um, the UN only probably about five or six nursing organizations. So we have uh, quite a bit of work to do in terms of really um, getting our nursing organizations involved within the UN system. So in terms of what we do as Sigma Liaisons, it's sort of twofold. One of them is really going out and attending meetings, either physically or virtually, um, building relationships with stakeholders, understanding the work of the UN and also global priorities, and really influencing and providing that nursing expertise uh, through that engagement. The other piece is then taking that knowledge back and those interactions back to Sigma members and um, disseminating that information to help nurses better understand what the UN is, what those global priorities are, and how we can actually influence those key um, policy priorities. And so we disseminate information through uh, you know, uh, mechanisms like this, through a webinar, we write uh, articles for nursing center, we published in peer review um, journals, and we also do quite a bit of uh, presentations to chapters. So, so those are just some ways that we disseminate information. But really when we talk about our role, it's that outward and inward engagement at the UN. And I'm gonna turn it over to Janice to talk about sustainable development. Thanks, Patrick. Thanks for getting us started. And I appreciate also everybody being here. It's fun to see um, all the different places that you're logging in from. I realized I said good morning at the beginning. That's only morning for me, not necessarily morning for everyone else. Um, so I hope this slide is familiar to most of you guys that are tuned in. This is, of course, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And the Sustainable Development Goals were agreed upon in 2015. They were an update from the Millennial Development Goals, if you remember those. And there are 17 Sustainable Development Goals, and behind these are 169 targets. And as Patrick mentioned, with our special consultative status as, as Sigma, as UN liaisons, we got a thumbs up for that. That was weird to see that going up the, um, going up the slide. But as part of our consultative status, we agree that we will promote the goals and aims of the UN. So the way we normally actualize that as Sigma nurses is typically to promote the sustainable development goals, which in all honesty is very easy for us as nurses because we do this every day in all of the things that we do. Many of us like to think of the sustainable development goals as kind of social determinants of health. And we recognize, of course, that you can't have good health and well-being without quality education and you can't have good health and well-being if you're without food, um, if you're hungry. So promoting the, the goals of the UN and then also making nurses more aware of these and in addition making the rest of the community more aware of what we do. I had in addition to New York, I also recently went to a conference in Utah and in Utah, I was one of the very few nurses at that conference, and it was related to the sustainable development goals. And I intentionally attended that conference with the goal of letting others know how nurses contribute to the SDGs and what our critical relationship is. And I think we would even go so far to say that without nurses, the SDGs can't be attained. So hopefully you're familiar with these, um, take a look at them and the targets behind them, and then we'll go to the next slide. This is something else we do often include in our presentations that we share with nurses and with other non-nurses is this one actually puts probably our favorite good health and well-being SDG3 in the center. And I, if you think about this, think about nursing being in the center of this, because we do represent, we're the largest healthcare workforce in the world. I think we're 28 million strong. And if we're in the center of good health and well-being, then it also means we're in the center of advancing all the other SDGs. So this slide, I know you can't read the tiny print um, that circles this, but all of those are showing how good health and well-being intersects with the other 16 SDGs. So it's just a visual to let to remind us how they're all interconnected and how all of the SDGs are important to the one that we probably value the most, which is good health and well-being. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that. 
So one thing that we did recently as part of the UN team is we reviewed our chapter reports. And if any of you on the call are chapter leaders, then you know that you submit this annually. And we looked at them for the past five years and they had been previously reviewed the five years before that. So if you go to the literature, you'll be able to retrieve the uh, chapter reports for like the last 10 years. So we looked at the last five years and we specifically wanted to know how we reported on how Sigma members and the chapter leaders reported our engagement with the SDGs. So if you see the, the year, that's the year of the chapter report. And then the total of uh, the total chapter reports that we reviewed, which was uh, you know, most of them submitted, and then what percentage reported engaging with service learning are the SDGs, how many members were involved, and I'm going to get into um, you know, a little more of this later how that works, but if you look at the bottom column, you'll see that about 50% of our chapters say that they had some type of activity that was service oriented are engaged with the SDGs. And that involved about 6,000 of our members where we have 135,000 members worldwide, but we engaged with about six of those and participating in those SDGs. And then that chapter report also asked us, asked the chapter leaders that are filling it out, was that an impact that was local, regional, national, or international? And you'll see that some of them overlap because some reported like an average of 16 reported that it impacted all of those because we do know local health impacts global and global health impacts lo local. So on the next slide, we'll show you a graphic that one of our other teammates made. Oh, I'm getting ahead of that. Sorry, yeah, go ahead, Patrick. I skipped a slide in my head. So um, I thought you guys were keeping up with what was in my head. This is, a, again, this is kind of just a summary of what was at the bottom, 50%. And maybe I, I thought I already did this. So 50% of chapters reported engagement, and you see the local and uh, regional, national, international impact. And then now I think we'll get to our really colorful, fun slide. One of our other teammates, Kathleen Aviza, made this chart. And what we really like about it is it just kind of gives that visual graphic of where Sigma membership, where we engage with the SDGs. So the numbers across the top are the 17 SDGs and the years down the side. And you'll see, not surprisingly, that the green one, of course, is SDG 3. And we do really tend to like um, to the right and left, which is quality education and stop hunger. And we maybe think of ourselves as less engaged with some of the other ones like 13 and 14 and 15. I'll, um, if we'll go to the next slide, I'll tell you a little bit more about what those are. You'll see our highest level of engagement, as we just mentioned, was good health and well-being and then quality education and zero hunger. But the ones that were reported less engagement with were things like life on land and life below water. Um, and even SDG 13 at the bottom, their climate action. This is a little surprising to me that we don't either recognize our engagement with climate action or we don't see the connection as much to good health and well-being. I think we're starting to see more of that, more and more in the news, how climate impacts health and what our role is even as healthcare workforce um, to reduce our, our carbon emissions. We currently, as, a, as healthcare in the U.S., we contribute 5% of the world's greenhouse gases just from um, our healthcare industry. So those are areas that we're starting to become more engaged on, at least in increasing awareness, but also actively trying to reduce our carbon footprint. And I'm starting to read more and more about that. And we've presented on that and shared ideas with how to do some of those things. So um, next slide. So of course, one thing we wanted to highlight, now remember 500 chapters said that, or well, half of 500 chapters said that they participate in the SDGs. So we could have shared 500 examples here and they were all really great and diverse examples of how we engage. So these are just a few that I hope will give you ideas of things you can go back and recommend to your chapter. Epsilon Chi happens to be my chapter, so I'm very familiar with, uh, with some of the things that we do. And we, one thing we did, because we're, I'm at a university, and we recognize at our university that many of our students are food insecure. And sometimes they have to sacrifice a textbook to pay for food. So one thing that we organized was a food drive for our university pantry. And we made sure that was accessible, not only to the university, but specifically for our nursing students. And we had you know, over a uh, you know, hundred different food items presented um, that we shared and we, we continue to repeat that. 
an Upsilon chapter in New York, they did something similar, but they did it in the community with the, um, with the food pantry. Beta Epsilon reported that they participated this past year in COVID testing and vaccine administration. And then Beta Phi, they've been actively engaging in DEI programs and education and awareness and implicit bias and things like that. So, I mean, the examples I think could be almost infinite, but these are just a few examples to share. And finally, for me, then before I pass it on to Mercy, we wanted to um, also include in that, since we're talking about how we engage, we wanted to include a Sigma initiative and partnership, which is another way that you can engage. This would specifically relate to, of course, SDG 3, Good Health and Wellbeing, or SDG 10, Health Inequities. Uh, and that... Uh, that QR code should be working. So if you want to take a picture of this or if you want to zoom in on that QR code to download this, what this is, and I've done it myself and I think um, some of my teammates have, is this is a partnership with Colgate and it's called the Healthy uh, Bright Smiles, Bright Futures Initiative. And what this is, is if you go on and take the the learning modules, and I think you might even get a badge for doing that too, but you then become a oral health champion and an oral health equity champion. And you, you become a champion and you learn a lot, which I think is valuable. That's one of my favorite things to do is to learn. But then Colgate will also send you a box of supplies that you can then share if you're doing clinics or if, you, um, if you're partnering as part of Sigma with a um, a pediatric clinic or in the community, it shares things, for example, brushing charts that shows kids how to time their brushing and to brush every day and some educational activities and toothbrushes and supplies. So I would encourage you to do that. You even get a, a nice uh, electric toothbrush that you can share or keep for yourself. But it's, it's an initiative with Sigma, gives you a chance to interact with the SDGs, but then gives you a really tangible tools and knowledge that you can promote in the community. So with that, I will pass it on to Mercy, who's going to take us out to the end here. Well, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Again, thank you so much for being here. Uh, Patrick and Janice, thank you for getting us started. So my, my role here today is to tell you a little bit about what do you actually do or what do we actually do as UN liaisons? And um, so that's one of the questions that we get very often in terms of what does it mean to be a UN liaison? What is the commitment like? What types of engagements can I expect? And in fact, right now there is a call for both uh, UN liaison and youth representatives. So if you were thinking about um, joining this team, uh, the next couple of slides, we're going to talk about some of the things that you do and examples of engagement. So in this picture, you have um, I see Janice and uh, Patrick and a few others from previous years and Eric. Um, so there are different Sigma um, events. One of them is convention, but Janice in the left-hand side is actually at the UN. And one of the things that we do is every September, we have UN General Assembly and Patrick mentioned this, we were in New York just a few weeks ago and we attend se several different high level um, meetings from the UN itself to other side events. For example, I got to um, attend a side event while I was in New York for the General Assembly where we were talking about climate change in Africa, because that's one of my focus areas have, you know, being born in Zambia and originally coming from Zambia, I'm very passionate about healthcare and global health within the African context. And I actually learned so much in terms of how mental health and climate change are interrelated. And I shared this with Janice at one of our uh, dinners when we were in New York, I was like, I've always thought about mental health because that is my area of research, but I've never really connected it to climate change. So learning so much information about different things that are happening in the world, how policies are affecting health outcomes in ways that we don't even think about, that's definitely been one of the highlights of my um, 
of my role as a UN liaison. I also got the opportunity to meet the Rwandan Minister of Health, the Zambian president for the first time in my entire life while I was at the UN. So you get to meet a lot of different people, you build relationships. And out of that came other consultative services, for example, in terms of improving mental health infrastructure on the African continent, which is like barely there. So you can see how this role can get you into rooms where you actually meet new people and build relationships and contribute to the global well-being and outcomes um, on the global stage. So there are a lot of different things that you can do. And usually when we have conferences with Sigma, uh, there's usually a special session that um, liaisons tend to talk about whatever it is that is important to the UN at that point. As Janice mentioned, our role is to work with Sigma, but to enhance the uh, objectives of the UN in terms of health and uh, global policy. So for example, um, one of the things that I was going to talk about at the July convention, Congress actually, was uh, climate resilient healthcare organizations, which is something that a lot of people are talking about, but how do organizations actually get to do that? So you, you stretch yourself in so many different ways. And I think that that's one of the reasons why I love this role is it's expanded my world perspective. It's caused me to look into things that I previously didn't look at and also just building so many relationships. And I'll talk about some other collaborations in the next couple of slides. So this was um, another example of uh, our team is, you know, Sigma Liaisons and in collaboration with ICN, which is the International Council for Nurses. Some of you may already be aware of the work that they do, but Sigma has been collaborating with ICN for a while now because they also have consultative status at the UN in terms of nursing and health. And so trying to make sure that we're collaborating with other organizations that are doing similar work so we're not duplicating efforts and we can actually have more of a synergistic effect when it comes to representation for nurses at the UN and at, at other global stages. So other things that you can get to do as a Sigma liaison is definitely publishing through Nursing Centered. Some of you may have seen different publications from myself, Janice and Patrick, and other UN liaisons that you may have received through Nursing Centered. And what usually happens is if there's a topic of interest that, you know, Sigma wants to explore a little bit more or something currently happening in the world and we just need, you know, more information about a topic, Sigma will ask one of us who have relevant um, experience in that area to write on that topic to educate the members. So this is actually a good way for you to disseminate your um, expertise in terms of global health and nursing and other uh, important topics to, um, to Sigma. Another area that you might see is publishing in other uh, scholarly journals like the American Journal of Nursing and the Nurse, uh, Journal of Nursing Scholarship. And Janice and um, Danny actually uh, just published a really great article, you guys. Janice, tell me, I, I know it's like A to Z something. Do you remember the actual title? <laughs> we just, this was published in Nurse Leader and it's um, um, reducing our carbon footprint while saving money from A to Z. Um, and I could probably throw the link into the, um, the chat for that, but it's something we originally presented as a presentation at the Creating Healthy Workforce environment, I mean, a conference when it was in DC. And then we thought, well, people were taking pictures of the slides trying to take ideas back home. So we thought we should try to write this up. And it's been a really fun one to share because I think what's so fun about it is because it, it's some ideas that you could do like today. And some of them are super easy. Some of them were hard, like maybe you can't get solar panels today, but mm -hmm. some of them were easy. Thanks for highlighting that, Mercy. 
Yo, if you have not read that article, it is so practical. Like I walked away thinking, wow, I can do this. And you know, in terms of actually promoting our chapters to do things within the chapter to incorporate SDGs, I think this is like a good starting point. If you're a chapter leader and you're on this call, I would highly recommend that you read that article because it gives you practical tips on where to get started and how to get started and everyday things that you can do both at the individual level as well as the organizational level um, or at the chapter level. And then we've had several other publications in terms of um, our work with Stigma, Patrick also just recently published another article. And I mean, the there are so many different opportunities. And because of my role with Sigma, most of you may have seen that I'm currently serving as a guest editor for Journal of Nursing Scholarship on a special topic issue for substance use and related conditions, because that is my area of focus in terms of research. So it just opens up the horizon in terms of opportunities. And of course, we always have SDG of the month on the Sigma website. And what we've done as liaisons is to create toolkits, which are simple one to two pages that gives chapters some information on what that um, SDG of the month is, some practical ways that you can engage and some things that you can do to improve outcomes related to that um, particular SDG of the month. So if your chapter has not uh, you know, engaged with this component of the Sigma website, please do that because that will help you in terms of you planning for your chapter reports and what you can do from month to month in terms of engagement with SDGs. Um, there are several opportunities at Sigma conferences for you to be involved. For example, the biennial hackathon and the exhibit table. And I know at the last convention, I did the speed dating. I, I facilitated the speed dating. Uh, session and that was so much fun because I got to meet like first time attendees and people who had not been to a Sigma event for a long time and just really making everybody welcome. So you kind of become the face of of Sigma. And I have to put there like I was already like a social media enthusiast <laughs> before I became a liaison. But it's such a great opportunity for you to be the face of Sigma on so many different social media platforms. So if you do enjoy social media, I think that you know this would be a really good role for you as well because you're constantly posting things about different initiatives that Sigma is engaged in and so on and so forth. And of course, you know, the CHWE, Creating Healthy Work Environment, Dine Around and Vision Board. So you get to volunteer for several different things. Um, I know that Eric and Dania and uh, Kathleen, I think just came from World Health Congress, which is like huge the way in Geneva. So there, you, it's not just Sigma related events, as long as you can show that the work that Sigma is trying to do is relevant to the different conferences and platforms with which you're trying to engage, that's, that's more than welcome. And also you get to represent Sigma at chapter induction ceremonies. So for example, um, just next week, I'm going to be at Texas Christian University at their chapter induction ceremony and I'm going to be their guest speaker. So there's always opportunities to engage in different aspects as well. So other things that you can do like outside of Sigma, because while we are representatives of Sigma, we want you to engage with other organizations. Uh, CSW is one of our big events that we, we tend to engage with, and that is the uh, Council for the Status of Women, and that's hosted by the United Nations. It's like a long two-week conference with um, different sessions going on at the same time, usually has a lot of different um, attendees from all over the world. And like this year, uh, Sigma had co-sponsored two events, one with Japigo and another one with ICN. 
And I got to serve on the um, presentation where we co-sponsored it with Japago because we're looking at um, maternal health and uh, health equity issues in the African context and what we can do about that. So that was very um, eye-opening and you get to work with people from other organizations. Of course, invitations to, to collaborate uh, with several different organizations. I think Patrick, um, you heard in the introduction that he, he is a global health consultant and he's done a lot of work in collaboration with ICN. And I've done a lot of work in collaboration with like International Organization for African Nurses. But really there's a lot that you can do in this role. And one of the things that I appreciate is you can make it your own, but still be able to uh, achieve the goals and the objectives that Sigma sets forth. So it's all about what inspires you, why are you interested in global health, how can you contribute, but also making sure that whatever you're doing is in line with the mission and the objectives of Sigma. And then um, we talked about keynote presentations. I just had the opportunity just well, I wanted to say last month because I feel like October <laughs> is already gone, but it's not. At the beginning of this month, I was invited to be a keynote speaker at the uh, Global Health Equity Conference. And that was something that, you know, I would have never had the opportunity to do, but they learned of my um desire and uh, expertise related to global health and health equity through my role as a Sigma liaison. And so I was invited in that capacity as well. So there's so many different things that you can do in terms of being engaged. And um, like I said, you can make it your own and Sigma is always responsive to, if you have an idea and it's in line with what they want to do. So for example, some of you may have already received um, an email from Sigma with a survey that just went out. That was something that Janice and Patrick and myself put together because we want to know how, how much do nurses actually know about SDGs? We're constantly telling them to do something and be engaged, but what, what do they know and how can we best support them? So we we created that survey and we, you know, we took that idea to Sigma and Sigma was very responsive and so we were even able to do that. So don't be afraid if you are in this role to make the role you're on, but also be in line with what Sigma is trying to do. And then the next slide. So just a plug here in terms of other opportunities for engagement. Um, so the Global Advocacy uh, Virtual Mini Academy is is one of the ways that you can actually get involved. So this is a mini six week academy and it's written and taught by former liaisons. Um, so there are a lot of people who've gone before us and uh, have so much information and so much expertise related to global advocacy. And they're going to be teaching this course. It's a really intensive course and it's a really intensive curriculum, but one that is going to teach you how to be a, a nurse advocate and how to be a Sigma liaison and what it means to have consultative status at the UN. It gives you a great overview in terms of SDGs so that as you're going out into the community and trying to educate people that you yourself actually has <laughs> some understanding of what you're supposed to be doing. And I know Patrick gave us like a quick overview of how the UN works. This would be a good, um, academy to join to really understand how does the UN work. So maybe you might be interested in this role, but you're like, I need to know more before I like, you know, dive in, this would be a good place to start in terms of learning more about what that means. Um, there is a, a registration fee. If you're a Sigma member, it's $50. And if you're a non-Sigma member, it's $150 to, uh, to participate. And um, the next slide, we have a couple of resources for you in, in, and just references. Like if you wanted to learn more about the UN, um, there are some links on this slide that would really be beneficial for you in terms of understanding what 
um, this role is and how you can participate. And one of the things that um, I think I failed to mention in, in another previous slide was you get to write statements that can be read at all of these high level meetings. It's just like so gratifying to think, oh my God, I did contribute to policy and I did contribute to what uh, came out of that meeting by submitting a statement that was actually considered in terms of action items and things like that. So I guess that is pretty much, um, Okay, so recommendations. Um, absolutely, recommendation number one, learn more about UN and global priorities through resources and Sigma. Janice said this, and I think I nobody can say more, and we need to hear it more. There are so many conversations that are happening about health and global health and all of this, and nurses are not at the table. We need to have better representation in terms of nursing, nursing's voice at, at the table. And like in my presentation that I was um, going to give at the um, convention, Sigma Research Convention, we're talking about, you know, environmentally resilient healthcare facilities, and yet we don't have any nurses on these planning meetings. And I'm like, but nurses are the ones who are going to be affected the most by all of these changes that we're trying to make. So how do we get nurses involved and how do we make sure that our, our voices are heard? And honestly, we can do so many things at the chapter level, at the individual level, but I feel like collectively we can do so much than we can do um, alone. Like I mentioned, I'm from Africa, and one of my uh, proverbs that I love so much is African proverbs is, if you want to go fast, you go alone, but if you want to go far, you go together. And this is our call to action for us to go together and make sure that the voice of nursing is really heard around the world at different tables in different rooms and make sure that our interests are well represented. And you are the people to represent our interests in all of these different spheres and all of these different platforms. And engage with Sigma. Um, I tell people I have like never regretted <laughs> being a Sigma member. I mean, in your, in my introduction, you heard that you know, I'm an author of a book. I mean, these are things that I like never thought I would be able to do, but now I can say I have a book that is published through Sigma, but that's because I've been intentional with my engagement um, with Sigma and engaging with different um, people and at different levels, building relationships and so on and so forth. So don't just pay your membership dues, make your membership dues work for you and contribute significantly to the, um, to the outcomes and the missions of this great organizations. And I, I think all of us can definitely be bold in our engagement with Sigma. That is our call to action for this biennium. And I challenge you to be bored and challenge you to, to stretch yourself outside of what is comfortable for you and, and engage in meaningful ways. And Mercy, so, actually, we had a question in the um, Q&A that I was able to read while you were talking. And it's uh -huh. related from Marion, um, who we, uh, we engage in pretty often with in our social media. Um, and she, she mentioned that she was kind of surprised that um, SDG 5 wasn't kind of our Sigma's top uh, that nurses engage with, that it didn't make the top three. Uh, mm -hmm. But I mentioned a little bit about your presentation at the Commission on Status of Women related to that. Would you want to share a little bit about what that was about in response to that question? Yeah, absolutely. So we know that, you know, maternal health is one of the um, one of the issues that's driving gender equity on the African continent. And in terms of, and I think that even here in the US, um, I shared this with Janice because actually one of the sessions that I went to um, at the UN, we were talking about gender equity and I was equally surprised that not just in nursing, um, I'm glad that you bring that up that we don't engage with that as often, but even on the global scale, 
uh, SDG 5 has seen the least progress in terms of everything else that they're measuring um, related to metrics for achieving these SDGs. And that was very interesting to me in terms of why is that? And it's it's really related to a lot of different things. Um, sometimes, and I, I, I like that this is a global audience, but sometimes we tend to, and I'm, I'm, I'm guilty of this, I tend to think of the US context in terms of some of the advances that we've made in terms of gender equity. But when you look at other places outside of the US, this is a continuous struggle day in and day out, whether you're talking about gender equity in terms of pay, in terms of uh, professional advancement, in terms of um, access to resources and gender-based violence. Um, these are real issues that are happening every day in several countries, especially low to mid-income countries, have not seen a lot of work done in this area. Part of it is related to culture, cultural practices in some of the countries where there's this hierarchy in terms of men than women. And so that really um, doesn't help a lot of the work that we're trying to do to promote gender equity. And just from the African perspective and the Zambian perspective, it's a very patriotical uh, environment. Everything is men, whatever men do, whatever men say is, you know, the rule of law and, and so on and so forth within the households, within government and, and so on and so forth. And there are a lot of people who are in, women who are in high places of influence, but they actually don't get to practice the authority that goes with those positions that they're in. So it's almost like filler positions. So I would, I think that when you think about it within the Western uh, concept, you think that we've done a lot of work, but when you look at it in terms of the global stage, there's still a lot of work to be done. I think that's wonderful. Thank you so much for answering that, Janice, in the chat, and then Mercy for elaborating on the work that you've done with that. Um, what do, would you recommend uh, as characteristics or previous experience for those who want to apply to be a UN liaison with Sigma, uh, what do you think would be good attributes for this individual to have? I can start. I think we probably all have a little bit different um, experience with that because as Mercy mentioned, um, we, you can kind of sometimes make your the position a little bit of your own. So you bring your strengths to the table. And I've certainly heard Patrick comment on this before. But one thing, one real obvious thing, take the global advocacy mini course because then that sh that shows your engagement there and then your your, you know, that you've gained a certain level of knowledge in that area. I also was going to comment and we said this earlier in the presentation, you can really participate in the UN without necessarily being a Sigma liaison. So I think one place to get started is go ahead and begin your engagement at the UN. You can sign up for the emails. You can, you can participate in lots of virtual events, including the one that, that Mercy just talked about. When I first came on board to be a liaison, I had my bags packed to go to New York for the Commission on the Status of Women. And of course, two days before we were supposed to leave, that got shut down. Well, every, they canceled it for that year, but the next year it went completely online and now it's gonna stay online. And even though some things are face-to-face, -face, they're available. So the side events are open to everyone. You don't have to have a special event to attend or a special pass to attend a lot of the virtual events. And again, I know I've heard Patrick comment on this. So I'm sure he's got some suggestions as well too. Yeah, I mean, I think for me, one sort of characteristic would be to be a self-starter. So Sigma and this team, it provides you the platform to be able to engage with the UN but there, it's not really um, prescriptive in terms of you must do X, Y, Z, right? They really give us the space to um, tap into our expertise and to build relationships and to carve out sort of our own um, role. And so that's certainly one thing that I would really encourage um, those of you who are thinking of applying is to be proactive um, and to, to really learn how to build those relationships um, within and beyond nursing. And the second piece is just being agile. Um, Janice just mentioned um, this uh, just now, but the UN is 
um, sometimes it's quite difficult to plan things um, because you don't hear about, you know, events until, you know, the, the week that it's happening or sometimes things change. So being able to be agile and pivot and, you know, change course, um, I think is a really good skill to have uh, on the team. Over to you, Mercy. Yeah, and I think for me, a fundamental uh, quality is to really be um, engaged with Sigma, because if you're going to represent Sigma, you have to understand Sigma, you have to understand the mission, the vision, um, the direction that the board is trying to go and so on and so forth. And we do get regular meetings with the leadership to make as aware of the initiatives and all of that, but coming in as a person who's already engaged with Sigma at different levels, whether it's at the chapter level and so on and so forth, I think that is definitely a strength because it's hard to represent something you don't understand. Um, so I would say that that is definitely a, a big factor in um, so if you're not actively engaged in Sigma one way or another, I would say this is a good time to start. And that uh, virtual academy might be a good place to get started as well. And, and I'm gonna add, cause I was sitting here thinking as you guys were talking, I think a, another couple of qualities are to be good teammates and to be kind of service oriented because you can probably tell that we're all huge cheerleaders and supporters of each other and of others joining in. So we, we really, when we see someone out there, we're always encouraging them and, and suggesting things that they can do and ways they can plug in. And also to, um, to be visible in that. So in your, whether that's through social media or part of our role again is to um, increase awareness. So being visible and showing that you're doing those kind of things, I think is, is helpful too. Too. That's wonderful. I thank you all for sharing your insights. And I love that um, they're all a little bit different, but complement each other so well. Um, a couple things to make note of, and I put these in the chat. Uh, the Global Advocacy Virtual Mini Academy, which they were speaking about, will open for applications again in February of 2023. So mark your calendars for the application cycle for the Global Advocacy Mini Virtual Academy. And then just a little plug here, um, if you are interested in being a UN liaison with Sigma, applications are open until November 1. So this is the perfect timing. You have about a week to um, work through that. And I did include that link in the chat for you. It looks like at... Um, the opportunity for research grants, I can answer that um, as a Sigma staff member, we do have research grants available, they go in cycles, so you can um, figure that out through the website, I believe we have some small research grants available right now. And I do see one other um, question related in, in the Q&A about planetary health versus global health. And I think uh, what we're differentiating there is planetary health, we're really referring to climate change and how it impacts the health of our of the earth that we live on, where that definitely impacts our personal health, but global health, we're referring to the health of people everywhere, which is part of Sigma's primary mission is to improve the health of people everywhere. So that's, I don't know if anybody wants to chime in on that, but that's how I differentiate those two. Was that your question for whoever answered, ask that one? I would say that's a really good recap, Janice. I think with all the new terminology coming out and advancements in that space, it can be difficult to differentiate when people use different terminology. So thank you for that. Uh, the individual said, yes, that's the perfect answer. So thank you. It does not look like we have any additional questions. So Patrick, Janice, or Mercy, do you have any uh, final words to say before I close us out? Thank you so much for being here. 97 participants, that's awesome. <laughs> we hope that uh, you learned something from our little presentation in terms of what the UN is and what your role or our role as UN liaisons are. And if you want to connect 
please feel free to connect with us. That's one of the things that we get to do is to just connect with people from all over the world and, and answer questions. <laughs> and I'll just add the same. Thanks for being here and we would love to connect with you. Same for me. Thanks so much for being here. Wonderful. So we want to thank our presenters today for sharing all of this great information. Sigma is grateful that you took the time to share with the audience, and we definitely look forward to hearing more from you in the future. We hope that you enjoyed this webinar. As a reminder, one week from today, you will be emailed a link to the evaluation for you to obtain your Nursing Continuing Professional Development Certificate. Be sure to check out Sigma's upcoming webinars and resources to support you and your colleagues at sigmanursing.org. Also, previously recorded webinars are freely available on the Sigma repository. Thank you so much for joining us and have a wonderful day. Bye, guys. I enjoyed it. It was fun and good to see you guys, even if it's just virtually. Yay, good to see y'all. <laughs> Yeah, I wish we had another trip to New York. That was fun. I'm ready. To, I'm ready to do that again. <laughs> that was Bye, awesome. everyone. Bye. 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 Thanks, Bye. Julia.